Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 786. And my guest today, some of you know him, Mr. Gad Cruder. Welcome. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining me. If you don't know my name, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I love traditional martial arts and I love traditional martial artists like you. And that's why we do all the things that we do here at Whistlekick. We're on a mission to connect, educate, and entertain all of you, no matter where you are, what you do, or even why you do it. Now, if you want to go and find all the things that we're doing to connect, educate, and entertain you, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place you're going to find references and links and all the stuff that we're working on, including our store. It's one of the ways that we pay the bills over here. We sell some stuff. Use the code podcast15, saves you 15%, lets us know that the podcast leads to some sales, helps us out on the back end. Now, this show has its very own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we close uh, the transcripts and the photos and the links and videos. And we tag episodes so you can find them. There's just, just a bunch of stuff over there. And if you haven't been there before, I would really encourage you to do so. There's a lot more going on on the back end of these episodes than you're going to find in the show notes. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? I need to tell you that if you want to support the work that we do, yeah, you can buy stuff. Yeah, you can share stuff. But here are a couple other things that you could do. You could tell a friend about what we're doing. And I don't just mean post it on social media. I mean, actually reach out to somebody and say, hey, do you know about Whistlekick? Do you know what they're doing? Do you know that you know the very things that we were talking about the other day or after class line up with what's important to them? Well, Maybe you'll consider sharing an episode or just sharing links to the things that we do with those folks. And then you might also consider our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. What we do with Patreon is we make sure that we deliver overwhelming value. The value that we put out over Patreon is designed to be so much more than the few dollars you pay. You can start as $2 a month, truly, that you will never quit. And we have very, very few people who quit. In fact, I can't remember the last time somebody quit. We have had people who up or down their pledges. Totally fine. And to all of you out there who are Patreon contributors, thank you. I appreciate you. Some shows name you. I'm not going to do that. And then the last thing, if you want to go and get the whole list of all the things you can do to help us because you're a super fan, you are part of our family, well, go to whistlekick.com slash family. That's where you're going to find that. It's a whole list as well as some exclusive behind the scenes stuff. And now it's time for my episode. I've gotten to know Gad a little bit. He's been a regular in the chat on First Cup for years now, but this is our first time getting to chat in person. And it's it's always fun when I get to talk to somebody that I kind of know, but not really. And that's what this was. We have some great conversation about not just martial arts, but his life and how, let's just say martial arts gave him a completely different path than he might have had otherwise. Check it out. How are you? I am doing fine. Is yeah. this the first time we're talking on like this is the first about... time we're actually talking. Wow. It's the first time. Yeah. That, yeah. That so, just, just, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I know you. So we Well, maybe because you know we've gotten to know each other through uh, yeah. Facebook Messenger and First Cup. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. You've been you've been watching First Cup for a long time. Since I think it was like 2000, was it 17 or 18? I forgot. Have I been doing that show that long? Holy cow. You have, yeah, you have. I mean, you, 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 you were doing it before I started watching it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I so would, started it before a lot of people were watching it. Yeah, like, oh my God, I got his amazing content I can watch, and I was like, doing my work at the time, just put my earphones in and then just, you know, listen to whistle kick or all, all the interviews. Like one of the first ones I listened to was with Superfoot Bill Wallace. Yeah. That was, that was an awesome one. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to have him back on uh, because I'm, I'm different now. I'm a different interview. It was 14 episode 14. You're going to be like 780 something. 780. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? We've been at this. It thing. is, yeah. <laughs> I was also a bit surprised when when Andrew asked me, like, um, I have no actual high rank, and I don't have any. I've done 
anything sig significant because you had Adrian Paul on, Cynthia Rothrock, and then then Mike Stone. You had Mike Stone, yeah. like all the greats, and then like little humble me is coming on. But well, yeah. well, and then you said, "Well, how long have you been doing martial arts? Like uh, since I was 11. so um, I'll right. be forty seven this week." So he said, "Yeah, there you go." Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you've heard me say this when other guests come on the show and they say something similar. I'm like, and how do you think I feel? I'm the one talking to all these people. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm in in the in the same in the same way you are, you know. Just I just like to train. Yeah. I just love martial arts and it just happens. Yeah, well that, that's the second best thing to actually doing martial arts is talking about it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes I, I think some of us might think it's better. Uh, well, <laughs> no, the, the absolute best are. is training yeah. with people while you, that you can talk to while you're while you're training. Yeah, you're right. So you yeah. you said eleven. Eleven. 11 yeah. Now we should we should let the audience know you you don't live in the U.S. So I live in the U.S. Yeah. So some of the things that you may talk about might be a little bit different. Now in the U.S., it is uncommon for someone at that age to get started. They usually get started younger or older. There's a there's a dip around okay. that kind of 10, 10, 11, 12, depending on where you are. And it starts to come back up uh, again, depending on where you are, late teens, early 20s. Was Is it the same for you over there? No, there are kids who start like five, six years old and kids who start at 15. It's not really a, okay. like a trend that's going on. Like it, okay. people start when they want to start or when their parents want them to start. So, sure. yeah. Okay. Why did you start? Well, sorry, let me close the door a bit because yeah, I can hear, I hear the dog. Like that, that's why I moved upstairs because like, okay, I don't want to be interrupted by my dogs, but it must be like some other, like a bird in the garden. So of course, you know, All right. we've, we've had, we've had, <laughs> we've had worse. I won't be more descriptive than that, but we've had far worse. Okay. Uh, so it actually started before I was 11. Because uh, as soon as I could walk and talk, my dad uh, taught me a bit of karate. Okay. Um, don't know how old I was, must have been like, like six or seven, eight years old. And he taught me just the basic kicks and punches. And he told me that he uh, he learned karate, uh, kyokushin, from a guy called John Blooming in, in the Netherlands. And at that time, I didn't know who, who he was. Uh, it's just, okay, that was your teacher. Great, fine. And he taught me like a bit of the style. It's it's like harder style of karate. Um, he taught me, uh, you know, how to, how to block, how to kick, how to punch. Uh, also, things like, okay, how to hit behind the target. So mm -hmm. don't stop right before, but you know, the... Um, that's a lot of schools teach, you know, if you kick, if you punch, you know, kick, kick behind the target. And uh, yeah, a lot of stuff like that. Later on, I discovered that John Blooming was the direct student of Masoyama. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of his, wow. like, yeah, yeah. One of his best students. And he brought uh, Kyokuzin to the Netherlands in, um, in the 1960s, I believe. Cool. Yeah, my dad only did it for a few years, but you know he picked up enough. I don't, I don't Still. even know what belt he has. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then okay. uh, I had an uncle who did boxing. He also taught, he also taught me some boxing, but I I didn't like to fight. I just didn't like altercations. I I didn't like to, you know, get get into arguments. You know, I, I would just walk away or you know just uh, not say anything. Were arguments uh, presenting themselves to you often? Mm, no, not at that time. Not at eight years old. It was like, uh, let's discuss the state of politics in the Netherlands. No, but it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but just, you know, you know, arguments that kids have, you know, over, over silly sure. stuff. I, yeah, I, I would just wouldn't like it. And I think as a direct result that uh, I also got bully, uh, bullied in school lots of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, um, and my dad said, you know, you got to stand up for yourself. But I don't like to fight. I don't like to do this. And then, 
I remember one time my dad said, like, this kid is always picking on me. It's like a big kid. And he's like, okay, because we were playing soccer uh, next to the school, the field next to the school, we're playing soccer. And it's like, oh, you know, he's, he's like pushing me all the time. He just, like starts mm. fights with me. So, okay, next time, uh, what you do is you faint with your left. When he blocks it, you grab your hand and you do an overhand to his face. Like, okay. Because he said, like, if you don't do that, you keep on getting bullied. Mm. So, so I did that and bang, right on his face. And after that, no more problem with the bullies. Actually became, I think, not, not a good friend, but like, you know, like he, he, he was very nice to me afterwards. <laughs> respected you. Yeah, he respected me. Um, guess sometimes. Did that like, change anything for you? Because, you know, I, it, I don't think it, any of us it, when we're young want to fight, but there's that's quite the transition to recognize mm -hmm. sticking up for yourself and what the consequences are. It it did, actually, because mm -hmm. you know, something in me said, like, like, like a fire ignited. It's like, OK. I don't want to be bullied anymore. This because you know, if 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 I don't do this now, then this will continue. I don't know for how long. Um, and one of my friends, one of my classmates who did Taekwondo, he was standing next to me. He said, "Whoa, I can't believe you just did that." You know, <laughs> it's like, but he, uh, in a sense that okay, that's not you. You know, doing things like that. So he, he said that that's great. You know. Uh, why, why didn't you come to Taekwondo, you know, and train with us? I was like, no, no, I, I don't want to, don't want to do that. Because I, I was not the athletic type. Hmm. I didn't like sports. But you were playing uh, soccer. Yeah, but that's different. Like, just like playing soccer, you know, just, just with your friends and it's like, okay, and that's it. But like joining a club or, you okay. know. It, it yeah, felt formal. Yeah, it felt too formal. And also another thing was that I was afraid of rolling, of going to the ground. Because mm. I had, a few years back, I had uh, a skiing accident. Because little Gad up in the mountains, the kitty class, okay? And you have to be pushed up the, pushed up the slope with... I don't, I don't know what you call it, but those things that push your butt, you know, just have your, your skis on the ground and then they push you up. Mm -hmm. Something happened and I fell down and I just rolled off the mountain. Like when one of those cartoons, like a big snowball. Like mm -hmm. And after that, I was so afraid of like rolling, like doing head rolls or anything. And I did anything to get out of gym class. Hmm. I was yeah, I was such a pain in the teacher's ass that he's like, okay, that's right. You're being punished now. No gym class for you. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> so and then were you badly hurt or was it that you were scared? I, I was just scared. Yeah. I was like, uh I, I was a bit hurt physically, but I think emotionally I was hurt the most. And you're so, still eight, nine years old at this time, somewhere there. Yeah, I think I was about eight, eight, eight years old. Yeah. Okay. So, and I think the thing happened with the uh, with uh, the trapping. Like now, I know. Oh, it's called trapping when you <laughs> catch the hand and then overhand. That time, I didn't know it was trapping. Um, I think it must have been about ten years old. And then by the time I was eleven, I was at a friend's house, a neighbor's house, also did taekwondo, and we were watching. Uh, Revenge of the Ninja with Shoko Sugi, one of my favorite ninja movies. And I was watching, I was like, oh, this is great, this is great. Because I'd always love uh, Kung Fu movies, Bruce Lee, uh, Kung Fu karate movies. Uh, and he said, you know, you want to be able to do this. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. So why don't you come to our club? And I said, okay. This is the Taekwondo friend? This is the Taekwondo friend, yeah. Okay. Like, okay, I was at his house, like sitting in his room watching TV. Like, I think it was VHS at that time. And it's like, oh my God, like, you want to be able to do this? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Why don't you come, come down? He's like, 
well, is there going to be any rolling involved? He said, no, no, no. Taekwondo, standing up. He's like, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll have a look. And my, my, my dad had been also pushing me to go there because he, maybe he noticed that I got, a, I got a taste of, you know, defending myself. Mm-hmm. And before, you know, it, it goes the other way. Maybe he thought, okay, it would be good to sort of guide that, yeah. not just like let let it go rampant. Because there were a few incidents at school where uh, kids that have been bullying me for a long time, and uh, I I didn't want to do anything to them because you know I don't like violence. But I remember sitting sitting in class, and that kid that was always picking on me in in the worst ways. And he was raising his hand to ask a question. And I saw that. And I saw this open. And I went, boom, right in there. And <laughs> you fell to the floor. <laughs> like, and the teacher was like, what just happened? Yeah, but he's always picking on me. But he wasn't picking on you now. Was it? But... As I told my dad, but you, you know, there was my opportunity <laughs> to, to get back, like in a kid's No mind. statute of limitations in, in your world. No, nope. no, nope. guilty <laughs> judge executioner. <laughs> keep, keep calling. And the, bam! Oh my God! And the same kid, you know, we were out skating, and um, he. he Again, he was bullying me, and I had my skates on to go skating because there was like a small, uh, there's small, small uh, canal near to us, and yep. in the middle of winter, and he was pushing me again and bullying me, saying nasty stuff, and I mm-hmm. just, uh, I did a leg sweep, and he fell to the floor, and I held my skate on his neck, and I said, "Come on, try that again." Try that again. And no, 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 I don't want it. I don't want it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the teachers talk to my dad. And my dad said, hey, it's like he's being bullied. You're not doing anything. So, you know, a uh, teacher was like, did you teach your kid to do this? And my dad was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, he at least he say, had your back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he also told me, he's like, mm, you got to be careful with that. You know, don't, don't take it too far. So I think he, he also saw something in me that I, I had a knack for because all these things like what I did were it came naturally to to do these things like with the with with a leg sweep and putting my skate on on his neck like I, n- nobody taught me that but I just mm. at that time like he was pushing me and I just saw the opportunity to do this and I executed the technique. But, and it was flawless. So if I were more to combat, it would say flawless. But, um, you can yeah, rip out so, yeah. <laughs> and so he said, okay, why don't you go there? And my friend also said, why don't you come down? No rolling. Okay, did it. And from the first class, I fell in love with it. It's like, okay, yeah, this is what I want. And what I, was it about it? What did you, what did you fall in love with? What did you want that you saw there? Um, people that respected me, mm-hmm. I think. I, I didn't get that in the classroom, but at that club, everybody was respectful to to each other. Uh, you you were learning together. You were learning something useful, and it wasn't only a physical activity like playing soccer or basketball, or running. It was also a more cerebral activity. Mm. So the, my brain was also involved because I, I like learning. I, I love learning languages. And uh, this is just another thing for me to, you know, to, to sink my teeth in. Yeah. And I also like the fact that, okay, it teaches me how to, how to defend myself against the bullies and also maybe I also understood that okay I will not only know how to fight how to kick and punch but also when to not to when to stop 
So those sort of things that that attracted me to Taekwondo. Maybe if I if karate or judo or anything else uh, was my first introduction, then I maybe I would have stuck with that as well. Because you 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 have those those things in in all martial arts, yeah. or 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 most of them, if you have a good school. Yeah, yeah I, I, maybe I was just lucky to have a good school as well. It was an ITF school in the beginning, mm -hmm. so also more emphasis on self defense, um, and also more forms, also mm -hmm. step sparring. Uh, not that much emphasis on like the actual competition sparring. But at least like, I, it, it was a while back. So, you know, <laughs> the little gray and different cell. schools do yeah. it differently, even within the same system. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, and you uh, find Taekwondo I, I was... eight, eight years old, you're enjoying it. It's checking some boxes for you. Yeah. It sounds like you kept going. That you went back and you went back and you went back some more. Yeah, I went back after the first class. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is cool. My 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 dad didn't even have to force me. Like he had to force me to do a lot of things, like sports wise, because my 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 dad like loves sports, but I I don't really like sports. I I like to move. I like exercise, but I don't like sports. I've never never actually liked. Um, Never been crazy about a football team mm. or a soccer team. Or is it the competition know? element that doesn't resonate for you? I think so, yeah. Okay. I think so. I I I I don't because when I did Taekwondo, I, I didn't do it to 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 win competitions, mm. uh to to bring a cup back home or a medal or anything like that. It was just more you know, for for me to to be physically active, uh, to learn new things, and to to be with like minded people, and that's why I kept going there. Yeah. Okay. And you you persist in Taekwondo for some period of time, and and I know just enough of your story to you know at some point that changed, but I have no idea when. I did it what's, for. What's the next Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Finish what, your what's, what's the next? What's the next point on the journey? The next. The next point is side. okay. So been doing Taekwondo eleven years, progressing, um, and I the uh, the belt tests weren't uh, mandatory. So there's a belt test. Okay, if you want to attend, you can. But if not, okay, you can also wait for the next one. And I, I wasn't, I was never really interested in that, you know, to, okay, yeah, I'll go, but only if I really have to, you know, because at some point you have to advance. Mm -hmm. So, um, because they wouldn't teach you new stuff, I'm guessing. Yeah, that too. That too. That, that's how they kept you going because you like to yeah. learn. Yeah. And it was nice to have a new caller. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. I've advanced, but it was more like, okay, I'm amassing all this knowledge uh, and skill. So, and that is enough for me. So, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I'm never, okay, I want to get my black belt in three years. Never. Um, but, and then I'm 18 and I'm going off to university. Mm -hmm. And what I've chosen to do is Chinese or actually Chinese languages and cultures. And it's probably because of uh, of my martial arts background. But like, not Korean. Was... No, not Korean, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, because uh, at that time, they were in the same building. So the first floor was Chinese languages and cultures. Then you had Korean and Japanese on the second floor. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's a little so... ironic to me, by the way. Why? <laughs> uh, historically, the the attitudes to, between Korea and Japan. Yeah, mm. it just it's. But they're just they're, they're the scholars. They're, just, they're like this. Right, the, right. I, yeah. I I'm sure it was fine. I just I I could imagine some, you know, some some older, native, you know, Koreans or Japanese folks here and there. 
put them on the same floor. Mm. Yeah, or even like the Chinese and Japanese in the same building. I've lived in yeah. uh, China, and mm -hmm. I've heard and seen some pretty uh, nasty stuff there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we all just get along? Um, yeah. Sadly, no. So you, university, and, and what I'm getting the sense of is martial arts opened your, kind of your world and gave you a lens to Asia. And you, I'm guessing, sure. you know, sure. it probably wasn't that, oh, you know, I think I might like this. I'm going to go to university and study Chinese language and culture. You probably were dabbling and reading and watching oh. Chinese films. And... And, and at one point I wanted to go to, uh, I wanted to be a policeman. I wanted to be a cook. <laughs> I want to be a veterinarian because I like animals. <laughs> Lots mm -hmm. of choices. And then, uh, at that time in the Netherlands, when you're about 16, 17 years old, okay, you got to prepare for it when you graduate, uh, sure. when you're 18 years old. Um, you have different kinds of high schools or middle schools, like a four-year, five-year, and a six-year. And the six-year mm -hmm. one, if you completed that, you can go to university. Um, so I've been reading all these leaflets and, 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 and books about, you know, what university you can choose and, and visited some university, uh, universities. Um, and actually I wanted to study acting. I wanted to go to acting school, but my dad was adamant that I not pursue a career like that. Useless. Useless. I had big fights, big arguments with him about that. Wow. Um, yeah, and um, he didn't think that, you could make a living at it. Yeah, concerned. Yeah, 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 I think I could have. I, I mean, I think if if you have really passionate about something, you can earn money with it. If you um, and so I think we're okay. A language then, because I'm good at languages. Um, then okay, I can really speak French and German, English, Dutch. Okay. What's next? Uh, as you're as you're graduating high school, this yeah. is what you've already yeah. learned those languages. Okay. Yeah, I was fluent in English by uh, the time I was eight. So my mom also doesn't know how how they came to be. It's like I was fluent. <laughs> watching TV was this wasn't a school thing. probably I. I don't know. I was, yeah, I was watching a lot of uh, British TV and some shows that were on the Dutch TV, like from Australia or the US or, or England. Um, and then, yeah, my mom taught me German and French and also continued that during middle school and high school. Um, then, okay, let's do Spanish or, but it's also like a, a European language or, or Italian. Yeah, boring. Hey, Chinese, that looks cool. Because, you know, I watch all these Kung Fu movies with all these Chinese, uh, all the Chinese writing, the little drawings. Can't make a word of it. Oh, okay, let's do that. Mm. And so I went there um, to the university and just being there in the library, all these old books with Chinese text and the smell there. I was like, oh my God, yes, I want to be here. You know, this is where I want to be. This is where I can truly study Chinese. Um, and it was actually Chinese languages and cultures because there's another university or college here in the south of the Netherlands, but they only teach you um, to the language and then you become you become a translator. So it's not really because, but I also wanted to learn uh, literature and philosophy, especially philosophy. And I asked, okay, do you also teach that here? It's like, no, not really. I said, okay. So went to uh, Leiden University in the north of the Netherlands, mm -hmm. between Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah. And, but then the first day of studies, the dean is there. He's having a uh, chat. Uh, and he says, okay, look to the left of you, to, to the right of you, you will not see those person, you will not see this person uh, in three months. It's like, oh, wow, that's a good way to, uh, that's a nice pep talk, you know, and uh, 
So uh, when, I, when I became a teacher myself, I vowed never to talk to my students like that. So, um, but, but he there was are martial right. arts instructors who talk about classes that way. Yeah. You know, look yeah. around, new students, you know. Yeah. So you should be encouraging students to learn, not discouraging. Um, so, yeah. So a little side note about my studies in Chinese. But, uh, and so I quit Taekwondo in a sense. Because you kind of had to. Yeah, I kind of had to work because there took one of schools er everywhere, but it's because you know, like the it was a because he he wasn't he wasn't kidding when he said, Okay, look to the left of you, look, look to the right of you. It's a hard study, especially in the beginning. It's also hard because of the way they teach, because it's a very discouraging way of teaching. Uh, but it's also, especially in the beginning, it's not an easy language to learn, you have to put in a lot of time. To sit in a library and write the characters over and over again. It's not like when you have English or Spanish or German where we all use the same alphabet, sort of, and then it's okay, I can just sit on the couch and look at a book and memorize it. You have to, like the whole writing system, you have to learn from scratch. And of course, the more you learn, the more you see patterns, and uh, the easier it becomes. But <laughs> that, that takes a few years. <laughs> Uh, it's a bit like martial arts, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah. That's what I'm. Yeah. That's what I'm. As someone who knows nothing about Chinese language, that's exactly yeah. where my brain was going. Yeah, no yeah, shortcuts. It usually takes that's, a few years. Yeah, no shortcuts. I, I mean, you 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 can learn the basics, uh, but you know that that's it. Uh, so, um, but then there were, of course, Chinese studies and. You go to, I went from a small town to a big city and you meet more people and people who've also done other martial arts than just Taekwondo. Um, and I started doing Kung Fu or, yeah, you call it Kung Fu, it's, or it's actually called Wu Shu. So uh, the, the, the Chinese term, Kung, Kung Fu just means the, or Kung Fu just means the effort you put in something to learn a skill. So, right. but... Now, now it's 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 synonymous because in China and Taiwan, you know everything is is kung fu. You know the writing, dancing, uh, host hosting a show. You know that's also that's also your kung fu. Yeah. Um, but it, but, but in the West we've narrowed it down. In the West, and it's and I also course. I also still 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 use. I I, I have a friend who teaches uh, Wing Chun in Amsterdam, and I also call him my kung fu brother. So and we are kung fu brothers. So it's 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 not that oh because you have some people say no that's not the right term. It's like who cares? You know it's it's just <laughs> so if people know if what I, you're talking about. Yeah, most of the time if we use wushu, then people think about these these people who 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 fly around the room in shiny pajamas. But like boxing, fencing is also wushu. So really? it's yeah, and any okay, kind I, of I, I, art because the word wu means. Uh, Marshall, but it's it's actually uh, the character consists of two two elements. It's a uh, to stop and to and a spear. So to stop a spear. So to stop an attack. And shu means a a technique or a skill or what you would call art. Hmm. Um, because I also feel that I'm. Uh, Apart from martial arts, language is also kind kind of my thing. I think a lot about about languages, and um, the word art is very deceptive because people think about art as like, oh, look at a beautiful painting on the wall. Yeah, that, exactly. That looks like a banana with an apple and a vase. That I like that. That is beautiful. Uh, they have a Picasso, and then people go like, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> did, did a kid? Draw this, you know. Um, so, art is not that it, it has to look beautiful or or ugly. Art is just again, it's a skill that you try to master. That is what art is to me. So, and I think that's also um, where am I going with this? <laughs> It's uh, well, we were we were relating the two. Yeah, you had started learning wushu, 
Yeah. So, and then I said, boxing is also a martial art because mm -hmm. it's a skill right. to fight. It's a, you're learning fighting skills. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's what it is. So, um, so I did Kung Fu for a while. I had to get up very early in, in the morning to do it because it was right before classes. Oh my God. And I'm not, I'm not the type of person to get up very early and start my, my, my exercise in the morning. I need my coffee and my sandwich first. <laughs> so that was grueling, but you know, I, I tried it anyway, uh, for, it was a year, I think. Yeah. Could be less year, a year at most. And it was a style called, I think it was called Tan Tui, which basically is just, uh, it just like it used to be an exercise regimen for soldiers in China. So it's just basic hmm. kung fu, basic wushu movements. I okay. If if you would ask me to perform the form now, I was like, no, I can't do it. I have even forgotten it. It's a very simple form that that I can remember. You just you just repeat that. What we also did was. It, it also introduced me to some other things that I we didn't do at Taekwondo. It's like hardening your, your body, like not using any padding. So we did an exercise where you would stand, uh, you know, stand opposite of each other. And then you touch your hand and touch it. You slam your hands into each other, your, yeah. your, your, your wrists. So talk, 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 talk. Um, so up and down, up and down. So you do that for a while, your arms get really sore and you have like these huge lumps on your on your wrist. And then I also, I also learned a Chinese trick. Um, you get a hard boiled egg. Uh, you put some uh, something like metal, like something silver in it. And you rub that over the lump, over the bruise. Oh. Yeah. And then the swelling goes away and the the yolk gets completely black. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. That that was fascinating. Like, I've, I've never, because back then we didn't really have Google, so I, I never Googled the science be, behind yeah. that. But it's, it's true. And like, I've, I've witnessed it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to look this one up. That's fascinating. Yeah, just uh, just find somebody, you know, just just slam your arm, arm into a doorpost. Here, like, you know? yeah, yeah. This <laughs> evening, just try that. You know, <laughs> let me give you a it's nasty an bruise and test something for an experiment. For science. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> okay, you said that you were in that program for a year. What yeah. happened? Um, I think. <laughs> I did it together with, uh, um, I kind of embarrassing, but I did it together with uh, with a girl that I liked. Like she she became my girlfriend. Uh, we broke up, and then I was like, okay, because we uh, we did it together each morning, and then we broke up, and then like I I I didn't want to do that anymore. It's like the idea of getting up early when you the idea of getting up and having like, to see her see her but I mean, she, oh she was also doing so i i saw her it wasn't doing chinese but it's just like you know it just didn't feel feel right any anymore it's like i, I no just just didn't do it um and then i i sort of stopped doing no actually huh i started taekwondo again hmm. yeah Actually, this is helping me to jog my memory. <laughs> it's been a while uh, since you thought about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to call you when I lose my keys again. It's like, okay, I, but... I will. I will talk. Hear me. You have to jog my memory. So, um, look in your shoes. Yeah, <laughs> there they are. Uh, so I started doing taekwondo again because there was um, there was a taekwondo club there, and uh, but it was WTF. So this was my introduction to you know. To something else, uh, Taekwondo, but it felt different. And so, anybody who's trained both knows how dramatically yeah. different they are. Different. Yeah, the, the the fundamentals are are fairly similar, but the forms yeah. and the 
the sparring and yeah. you know the the age that you're talking about it wasn't it's 90s. continued to differentiate right like it's it's you know small angle between the paths but as we follow time they get further and further apart yeah i, I started learning in 87 mm -hmm. so it's a different era for taekwondo also and and then in the in the 90s mid late 90s um and it was different because like you really had to kick somebody like a like a mule yeah so and um yeah um actually i'm lying now oh my god i'm lying my ass off now because i i was doing w2f before okay oh all right i did go did from, you switch them from 11 to to 18 Mm -hmm. But because we moved house, we moved from the middle of Holland to the south of Holland, and I joined a club that, that was WTM. Okay. Yeah. So, but because we went immediately to university, I skipped that whole part. <laughs> well, in my mind okay. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, but you know, it's basically the same when when you first do ITF and you have those little shoes on and you and you can. It's, it's more like point sparring. It's like, boom, mm -hmm. okay, I have a point. And with WTF, it's like, boom, that's not enough. You really have to see the other person feel it, feel your kick, feel your punch. So, but I, I actually kind of, actually kind of like that. You know, it, it felt more, more realistic that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Plenty of people like it for that reason. They like that contact. Yeah um didn't really like being on the receiving end but <laughs> no, i was just kidding um only a special few like getting kicked i know people who like to get hit they are a special breed there is a sort of masochism involved in yeah. martial arts like we've i've you you've discussed that a few times like other people <laughs> You know, people who 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 get their you know legs in a in a in a lock and get kicked in the head for for as a hobby as a sport as a you know way of life you know this <laughs> we are a weird yeah. bunch yeah we're a weird bunch but you know and um so so WTF I I picked it up again university WTF um and also did some hapkido while I was studying. Also got introduced to that because somebody at the Taekwondo club also gave uh he was starting hapkido classes and it was hanmudo actually like an offshoot of of hapkido um and also did that for for a while i think also about a year i think um and i also did some wing chun during that time so i got introduced to to a, a lot of martial arts yeah, yeah, and also I also like the Wing Chun. I really like the Wing Chun training. I like the Hapkido because of the throws, and believe it or not, the rolls. I started enjoying the rolls because I actually. How did that change? Um, I became more adventurous during the years, so I also became less frightened to try out new things, and I think martial arts also help with that. I mean, to, to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and so I did, I did Hapkido, I, was, uh, I like the wrist locks, I also like the fact that, uh, you can, you don't have to kick and punch your way out of a fight. Of course, the first step is avoiding the fight, but sometimes you have no choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but also like, okay, when somebody attacks you, you don't have to start kicking and punching. Can also be quite difficult if the person is really close to you. So if you learn a grappling art like Hapkido, that's that's very useful and you can also re, you can also restrain a person and say okay you know it hurts right now okay i can break your arm but i can also stop the choice is yours yeah? and then you know luckily i've never had to do this but it's it's good that because if, if you don't learn that skill you also cannot offer people that choice hmm. you might just go break the arm because you've also never learned when to stop or you just punch him in the throat or in the face and uh, with very, very dire consequences. Um, so Wing Chun, Hapkido, still doing Taekwondo. 
And then it was, and at that time I um, had a choice to go to Taiwan or to China for a scholarship. Okay. Yeah, it's part of the part of my studies, uh, an exchange program. And you can, okay, you want to go to Beijing or do you want to go to Taipei, to the Taipei Language Institute? I said, oh boy, now where should I go? And was it a difficult decision? Uh, the beginning it was because, you know, you learn China. I don't want to make this too political. <laughs> sure. But first you, uh, because like disclaimer, I love China and I also love Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with people from either country. Okay. So, uh, but I saw the pictures of and the stories of people who had been to China and the people who had been to Taiwan. And Taiwan was all palm trees, sun, people smiling. And Beijing was people <laughs> with woolly hats. It's like... <laughs> Winter time, the stories there because at that time also the um, the like the the dormitories there was were, were really bad. I heard people telling stories about like cockroaching, uh, mm. cockroaches climbing into into bags, and and it's like oh, it's awful. Um, uh, also the uh, the amenities were also very very bad, and then Taiwan is completely different, but. Um, I also met some Taiwanese people and I met some Chinese people at the time. And for, uh, and this still holds true to to an extent that um, I've lived in both countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in Taiwan, I, because I ended up staying there for for a longer time. We get there, but in Taiwan, I sometimes had to look in the mirror. It's like. Oh my God, like, oh yeah, I'm not Taiwanese. I look different, but they don't make me feel that I'm different. Like they, they, they really, um, they're really welcoming and make me feel like one of them. And China, there's always this, people are friendly, but you always notice there's, okay, there's this, this uh, divide, there's this wall between you. It's like, okay, Westerners and, and Chinese. Of course, there are exceptions, and of course, but especially if in in the late nineties, it was it, it was that way. When I talked to the the Chinese students that came to the Netherlands to study, like it it was it was different. It was different, and um, I was also taking uh, religion classes at that time, and I also noticed mm -hmm. that. Um, my, my professor had also taught me that because of the Cultural Revolution in China, lots of temples were destroyed. Because he also did research there, and he said, you see, you see people at the side of the road with incense sticks or joss sticks, and it looks like they're praying. And he said, yeah, and I would ask that old lady, uh, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm praying to, 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 to this, and, this and this deity because... Uh, still pray but you know don't tell anyone hmm. um and he also said because he he also he he was jewish a uh, very famous professor jewish uh, uh studied at the Sorbonne in paris and then he also lived in taiwan for many years and he became a taoist priest there which i don't think many foreigners have done <laughs> no i wouldn't think so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and he, uh, so also, also because of him, I, I chose Taiwan because I want to see more of the, uh, of the old culture. I want to visit temples. And, you know, if you already tell me that there are not many temples left in China, it's like, what is the point in, in going there? So that was my reasoning at that time. Uh, and then I, uh, I got a scholarship to, I won a scolarship to, now what, win is not the right word, but you know, you, you have to. Uh, apply it and. Yeah, apply and you have to make your case. Why do you want to go there? And it was one of my arguments because I want to see actual, you know, I want to see more, more of the culture because mm. uh, that professor was also on the board of the, you know, mm. uh, 
of the professors who, who had to uh, say who was going to go and not, but they actually had to like ask people if they wanted to go to Taiwan. Um, they have to beg people not to go to China and to go to Taiwan because most people want to go to China because they thought, okay, I'm studying Chinese, so China is the obvious choice. So yeah. for me, it was the opposite. It's like, no, I'm, I'm going to choose Taiwan. I'm going to do something else. And uh, never regretted a choice, a moment in my life. Never. What What was, so, I mean, what we're getting at this point is is even from a very early age, you've had a deep love, if I can use that word, for Asian culture, you know, specifically Chinese culture, but obviously you you know, weren't exclusionary in what you would train. Yeah. And I'd kind of like to take a small, maybe it's a detour, maybe not, mm -hmm. and talk about how your education in Chinese language and culture maybe changed or added to your martial arts experience. Because that's what most of the folks listening or watching this are never going to pursue Chinese in an academic way. Yeah. Even if they're, you know, Wing Chun, Wushu practitioners, Tai Chi, Bagua, Ji, doesn't matter what it is, they're mm -hmm. probably stopping at the training and not going much deeper. So you have an opportunity to kind of enlighten all of us. How, what, what were you able to take back from the academics and bring into your training? Um, I actually got fed up with the academics. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I got fed up with the academics. So what I got from it uh, is a very good question. And what I got from it is that the academics are not for me. Hmm. Um, and that was after the year in Taiwan, because in a year in Taiwan, I had learned more about the language and culture than two, three years at university. But that, but that makes sense, doesn't it? Immersing yeah. yourself. Yeah, and also, um, I thought it was quite embarrassing that a very famous professor uh, standing at the coffee machine when I got back to from the year and he was at the coffee machine um, a place where we used to study like a little uh, plaza where you could sit with chairs and, and, and tables you know you could study there drink some coffee and have a chat and he was talking to another professor from China and he just asked a very simple thing about you know you want some milk in your coffee and he couldn't do it hmm. he, he was stumbling over his words it's like i really wanted to go over and help him it's like no that's how you say it but he was like he was a famous professor written so many books very knowledgeable about one subject hmm. maybe agriculture or economics or something but actually like the the day-to-day -day, like the communication between the people the language but, but he'd never used it yeah he understood it but he didn't really understand it. And, you know, I th there's a pretty strong parallel there with, with martial arts and whether exactly. you look at it as people who criticize an art that they've never trained in or people who say this, this material will work, but they've never, I mean, we, we did an episode talking about how important sparring was, right? Like there, yeah. there's a, there are some folks who train and they never spar and they trust that they'll yeah. be able to use it. I think we could all imagine what that would have happened for that professor had he been on that trip with you. He would have embarrassed himself likely early on. Yeah, exactly. So it's a good detour that you took asking me that. Um, because um, I figured, okay, if if I want to uh, continue to evolve, I have to completely immerse myself in the language and culture and that is not going to happen here and that is when I decided to go back to Taiwan how to... long so you said you spent a year in Taiwan on exchange yeah about a year Netherlands. Yeah. and how long were you home before you said I'm going back oh <laughs> 
I was like three months in Taiwan when I said that. <laughs> I like, oh, I want to go back. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But actually, in the way of martial arts, um, also to to answer your question about okay, okay, what what did the language help me with with martial arts? Uh, to be honest, not much. Not not what I had thought. What I had hoped it to be. Uh, that that happened later on, but. Like the first uh, year there, I discovered that it was not very easy to find martial arts because uh, there was Taekwondo uh, at the at the university Taekwondo club, but it was that was such a bad experience. Like I went there with uh, another uh, another classmate from uh, also from the Netherlands uh, who also did Taekwondo, so we both went there and it's like that that class was uh it was the teacher was hardly ever there so uh not not to say okay that 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 white belts are bad and whites white belts don't know anything but this person that was there okay she had a white belt i cannot change that historical fact she had a white belt but she didn't know how to do a warming up i mean you can be a white belt and do the best warming up mm -hmm. ever I, i've met white belts who who did that, not her. And it's like, oh my God, it's like just standing around in class, like, oh, okay, what are we going to do next? Oh, oh. Like, spend five minutes thinking about what to do. I was like, okay, if this is the state of martial arts in here in Taiwan. Hmm. Okay. Then you start looking and I found, I, I saw like people practicing in the park as well. Uh, and there were people with the shiny pajamas on and they play some Wong Fei Hong music. Uh, dun, 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 you know, the Chinese music. Mm -hmm. And I have these people doing all these movements. And yeah, that's not what I want. I mean, uh, expensive as hell anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of disappointed that there, there was not much in the way of martial arts there. And also... Um, there was martial arts and... I, it was just like, for me, it seemed a bit like a scam what they were doing, or it was just it was just too too expensive. And people there were more interested in basketball and baseball. Like mm. everyone still is one of the best, I think, one of the best baseball teams in the world. So yeah. they they are much more they are much more interested in that. It's like oh, martial arts. Oh no, that's for old people in the park. So and and you saw that you know people practicing qigong and all that stuff. So. Also, not what I was looking for at that time. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. To uh, maybe a bit of an elaborate way of answering, but it, it's okay. It, it, well, it we do on the show. Me. It it didn't help me one one bit. Like I was that sort of. Oh, okay. I'm gonna. From the first day, from the first few weeks of my studies, and actually before I started, it's like okay. When I heard about that, you could get a scholarship to go to China or Taiwan. I was thinking. This could help my martial arts because I can leave the Netherlands and I go there and study like martial arts where it was invented. I can go there and imagine my disappointment. And we also tried to look at like a Kung Fu or Wushu club and they were practicing and it seemed like a bit more, you know, a bit more useful uh, what, what they were doing because they're also practicing grappling and other things. And it's like, hey, okay, it's... Uh, they're not just like doing, you know, the the and actually doing some 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 practical applications as well with the martial arts. Um, so you went there. So, no, sorry, no foreigners. Uh, you're only going to be a, not not because we were we were foreigners. We were not Chi Taiwanese or Chinese, but just because okay, you're only going to be here for a year. We're not going to mm. invest. My shifu, my teacher, is not going to invest. Mm in you, uh, his energy, when you're going to leave in a year anyway. That seems like such a, a Chinese martial arts philosophy. You know, I've never, I, I've heard a few of these stories, and they've only come from Chinese martial arts schools. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen in other schools, but uh, it, it, you know, my experience of karate schools, and I've had many, has always been, you're here for a year, let's see what we can get done in a year. Yeah. Yeah, if, even if you're there, okay, I only want to attend for a few classes just to get a taste of it, just to know what it's what it's all about. I mean, 
Sensei Seth does that in his videos now. I, I, yeah. I like to watch his videos where, where he goes to other schools. Okay, let me try Capoeira. Let me try this. Uh, yeah, and they're also very welcoming. Yeah, sure, you want to attend a class? Sure, whatever. Um, I don't know if it's like for only like if it's something Chinese or uh, Chinese martial arts, but I've I've heard other people say say that as well. We I we we didn't even try af after that. We just were like, <laughs> okay, whatever. So and also I met my wife three weeks in when I was in Taiwan. On the and, uh, on exchange, that first trip. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. So now, I mean, it, admittedly, audience, I I knew that you had met your wife in Taiwan, but yeah. I didn't realize it was that quickly. Three weeks in, I was yeah, I was a young man, and so that's uh, part of why you wanted to go back. I fell in love with Taiwan, and I fell in love with my wife, and all, not only the reason that I wanted to go back because of her, but it it was one of the. Uh, I also love the country. Sure. Yeah. And I also want to know more about the culture and everything. So, spoiler, I didn't finish my studies. So, mm. I chose not to get a, a degree. Yeah. What did your I dad still... think of that? Yeah. That's... uh. Whew, now you've touched on a very mm. now we get to the crux. He uh who when I was in Taiwan and I told him that by email. His only response was because I, I had already spoken it mm, spoken about it to my student counselor, and she said that's a good idea. Many for many Western students do that. They um uh, they they study there. They find work because it's not hard finding. It's mostly it's it's English teaching work. But I I, I love teaching, so that's that's no you know there's no punishment for me. Uh, so okay, you can make some money there and study there. That's a good idea. My dad didn't think it was a good idea. He wanted me to stay in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, then find a finish my studies, find a good job, uh, like an international job. And, you know, um, he, he just had plans for my future that were different from mine. Yeah. I was more interested in learning about the language and the culture and, you know, and go from there and see what the future holds. Uh, still still finding my way. I mean, what what do I want in life? What What do I want... There's more to just studying and um, yeah, uh, short of it is we had a huge row. Like a, a huge Not row. surprising. And they also blamed my wife for, oh. Uh, oh. for, yeah, for, you know, um, forcing me to go back to Taiwan, but no, no. But if I may. You no longer live in Taiwan, so am I? Am I correct in guessing that maybe that eased over time? No. Yeah. Yes and no. You moved back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes and no. Because um, my mother even said, "Why can't you find a nice Dutch girl?" It's like, "Ooh, mom, don't say that." And, and, and to be fair. Every mom has said that to every son about wherever they live, if they want to leave, if they want to go elsewhere. You know, I mean, I, it's no secret. I'm, I'm Jewish. I've but my, my a number of times my mother has said, you know, yeah. can't you find a nice Jewish girl? I think mean, it's as cliche as you get. My household is even more, my family like even, was even more Asian than my wife's family. That's what she said, because... Not a typical Dutch family, but maybe not surprising because my my mother is from Indonesia. My sorry, my grandmother is from Indonesia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe there's also the you know from like the first food I ate was you know Indonesian food, spicy mm -hmm. Indonesian food. Like as soon as I could you know got off the baby food, it was rice. That's <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
they so when I said okay hey uh, so after that year got back to Netherlands to start my studies again reluctantly and then I also told them you know oh but uh, my wife's gonna my girlfriend at that time she's gonna visit us all hell broke loose Oh, but you have to do this. You have to find a summer job, and it's this. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but um, a lot of bad stuff happened, um, and my wife had to. Uh, my dad actually forced me to put her back on a plane to Taiwan. It was one of the hardest things that I ever had to do. Mm, so sorry. Um, but I also thought, figured, okay, she's going back to Taiwan now, but I'm going after her. Then I moved to another city, no longer live with my parents because I had to study. So for my studies, I'd be closer to the university after summer. Um, and, uh, then my wife came over, my parents again, but my parents were like, again, totally against that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my wife gave me a, a plane ticket to cash in. She said, okay, you can cash it in next week, in a few months, next year, whatever. It's your birthday present. Here, here's your mm -hmm. plane ticket. And I said, okay, I'm going to go back to Taiwan. I'll move with you. This is new, this day. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. What are we going to tell your parents? I said, I'm going to tell them. Um, which was a shitty thing to do. I still feel bad about it. I'm not, I don't regret the way, uh, I don't regret the fact that I left, but I regret the way that I left. You were, you were young, what, 22, 23? I was 22 and uh, I, I was also scared of my father. Like I- You're not alone in that. He taught me a lot in the way of like martial arts when I was younger, uh, how to stand up for myself. Uh, he, he could be a very sweet man at times, but he also had a very violent side. Hmm. Um, at the time, I didn't understand it. But uh, recently, I've connected with a friend from high school again, seen him for years. And we also talked about this, and he said, there were times I just wanted to call the police for you or the, what do you call that the like the child services or we would call it child protective services in the u.s child protective services yeah yeah you would like there were a few times but you know because you know, he's your dad and you know i didn't know if that was the right thing to do but it was yeah it was tough mm. yeah I'm, I'm sure i, I wouldn't call him like 100 percent fully abusive but because still the opinion that sometimes kids just need, you know, a smack on their butts. That's mm -hmm. sometimes kids need that. Yeah, a bit of discipline. But uh, you can also take it too far. And the same with martial arts. You have to know when to dish out the aggression, the violence. But you have to know when to stop as well. There's a line. And my dad crossed that line a few times. Sure. Yeah. When dad and son are squaring off, when just, but more like an argument, like a verbal argument, and all of a sudden, like he punches me in the nose. Well, I remember when I was about 18 years old. Mm. I think the discussion was about my studies again, uh, what I wanted to do because I, I wanted to follow my own path. And, and, and then he punched me in the nose and he said, like, I was so upset. And then he said, Oh, okay. Uh, I said, why did you do that? So I thought you were going to hit me. I said, I'm not going to hit my own dad. Like we have an argument, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I have some resentments towards you, but I'm not going to hit you. Like, yeah, it was one of the mm. many, many instances. So I was also a bit like, Oh my God, you know, what is he going to do? So didn't tell them. Uh, so we, we eloped. Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, we, we left in the middle of the night. 
thieves in the night. It felt like that. <laughs> and uh, to go to go back to Taiwan together. To go back to Taiwan, yeah. And I I left my parents with you know with with a lot of uh, with a lot of problems there. Also some financial ones because they were helping me out with the apartment and and the rent and everything. But it's um, yeah. So like I said, it felt like a shitty thing to do. But at the time, I felt I had no choice. I was cornered. Yeah. So I I went back to Taiwan. So um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and yeah. To make a long story short, I didn't speak to my parents for three years. Mm. So it, yeah, it was uh, it was it was that that bad actually, because um, I was really angry. I was scared. Uh, lots of emotions going through me. So, uh, but there was in Taiwan. Um, but that's it's. All in the past now, or some of it is in the past, but you know, the past never leaves us completely. Uh, and then I started my life in Taiwan because I figured I'm never going back to the Netherlands. I'm staying here, staying in Taiwan. Um, and that was when I started to discover that uh, I don't have to actually join a school to study martial arts. So to get back to the martial arts, I started practicing on my own because the situation hadn't changed. Uh, I love martial arts. Um, for me, it's not just a sport because in the Netherlands, uh, martial arts is called, and people say, oh, you do Taekwondo. Oh, that is a fighting sport. Hmm. Um, same as in German. Uh, in in Dutch, it's called Fechtsport. In mm -hmm. German, it's called Kampfsport. But both mean fighting sports. So it's seen as a, as a sport. Um, a few weeks ago, I read an article about how karate evolved in the Netherlands and as a sport. And it's really interesting to see that, you know, uh, it was written by a uh, uh, karateka who... Um, you know, who 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 analyzed this and it's like from very early on that in the Netherlands, like any activity is labeled a sport. So it's mm. there's competition involved, there's exercise involved. It's more of a um, exercise is usually a social activity. The social element is very, very important here. Um so but for for, for me it was um for me, it was never a sport or a hobby or an exercise. It was more like something that was, you know, part of me. Mm. Because all through these years, like, I think there were two things that really kept me going, from helped me from going under. Um, and there were two people, Bruce Lee and Chuck D., so those are my two heroes growing up. <laughs> and this, this is where I let the audience know that you know we that that was probably the point, the first point that we bonded over was was over hip hop music. Yes, exactly. And I heard like, oh, Jeremy is a hip hop head as well. Okay, that's good. That's good. That was um, because throughout it all, and the thing that you know, Chuck D's voice, and do you know? Uh, welcome to the Terror Dome. Mm -hmm. The first sentence, what he says, I got so much trouble on my mind, refuse to lose. Mm -hmm. That is constantly in my head. It still is. Whenever something, you know, is weighing you down, that comes up. So much trouble on my mind, refuse to lose. Don't give up. And of course, Bruce Lee, um, I'm going to say something controversial, maybe. <laughs> do it. I, yeah, let's do it. And uh, I don't know if Bruce Lee is actually such a special martial artist. I don't know that. 
what I mean is that I have no doubt that he is an excellent martial artist. He is gifted, of course. Uh, but is he special? Like, maybe at that time, there were not many people who could do what he did. But I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if he was or, or not. But he so, still meant something to you. He, he meant something to me, but not in the way that you think, because like, okay, look at him punch or kick. Yeah, okay, that's excellent. I want to be able to punch and kick like Bruce Lee. No. It was when I read the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, just the things that he said. One of the things he said was like, like you have to learn yourself, like what kind of person you are. And the best way to do that is through interaction with other people. I'm not, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know. I don't know the exact words yeah. anymore, but um, that's uh, also other things in there that also helped me with becoming a good teacher. So in a way, Bruce Lee was my teacher, but not because I watched his movies or anything else. I, oh, okay. That's how you punch it. That's how you kick. But more of like in the way, you know, how to, how to look at the world and how to, how to think. What so, did your, your training, you know, we're talking about you training on your own and, and, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that you're taking inspiration from others around you, whether they were figuratively around you or yeah. literally alive, passed on. Yeah. And, and we're in agreement. I mean, we, we talk about this on the show often, but, you know, back 20 years ago, there weren't a whole lot of people training on their own. Uh, it was really, really frowned upon. What did your training look like? What were you doing? Where were you doing it? Just any, any place I could train, just find a, find a spot somewhere. And it consisted of, um, and this is not just like, it, it was all the way through like all these years that I was in Taiwan. I had excursions to, I did some Aikido there. Um, I met some other people. I trained there for a while, there for a while, but most of the time I was just training at home. For a while, I also lived with my with my in-laws. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they lived on uh, a flat, an apartment on the ground floor, but they had a huge hall with there's the altar there was an altar in it but in front of the altar uh, there was an area where, where i could train mm. so and i just learned from memory because at that time I, well, did we have youtube yet but maybe we had youtube but not many like so many videos that we have now not really uh, not really i come from an era when if if you as a kid if i wanted to learn something about martial arts i had to go to the library hmm. pick a book read a library yeah. do, some, read, yeah. do that kind of research yeah you are not alone in that you've had a lot of guests not just going online and watching a video and like okay that's it and then commenting is, about how terrible it is that is the truth yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh lately i've been writing down some thoughts about that it's like Okay, like every time I've I've come into the habit of every time I've thought about martial arts, I just take out my phone and like write down this thought. Um, but yeah, so uh, my training just looked like a oh, basic warming up. Um, and I'm also saying this because maybe there are people listening now who are in the same boat, especially now with you know what's been going on in in the world. Um that okay, you, maybe you don't know where to start, but just start simple because martial arts is, is not just, that's what I'm saying, it's not just a sport, okay, because a football, okay, or any a, a ball and I throw the ball or I kick the ball or a tennis, I have my tennis racket and my ball and I hit them. So, but martial arts is something that is just part of who you are. Part, I, I actually, I would argue that it is part of who you are as a human being. It's something basic, what you are as a human being. Even if you say, oh, I don't like martial arts, I don't practice martial arts, you do. Every time that you get out of bed, you practice martial arts. Because whether you, unconsciously, you, you know how to defend yourself, you 
uh, the way you open a door, the way you walk, trying not to fall down the stairs. It sounds silly, but maybe maybe to some people. But I, I I'm with you. Martial arts is 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 ingrained in in us. Like the, and I'm not talking about. Yeah, we now it's my time to make a little side note because I think about this a lot, and I also don't like the term traditional martial arts. Hmm. To modern martial arts or mixed martial arts. So I'll get back to the training on your own later, but now that I touch upon this, uh, martial arts is just martial arts. Because I said, I come from an era when you had to go to the library and everything was just martial arts. Karate is a martial art. Didn't say karate is a traditional martial art, just karate is martial arts. Judo is martial arts. In Holland, it's a fighting sport. It's a, everything is a fighting sport. Maybe that is even better to call it that because then you know everything is a fighting sport, but you don't have that distinction. Because if you really think about it, the only traditional martial art, the, the, the most traditional martial art is going after each other with clubs in our hand. That is the, that is the most traditional martial art. And a mixed martial art, a mix of what? Like, use our we use our hands and feet. Yeah. And okay, in this school we move this. So way. many ways to move. There's so many, so many ways to move. So again, language. Again, I I kind of I I also use it traditional martial arts of of course, but sometimes I feel that it's not. Um, it's not fair to to make that distinction between because it's 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 all martial arts and and you know Gat, I think I want to have you back to to go deep on this subject because we're not going to be able to give enough time to this and I can no 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 no, no this no. is something that you've put a lot of thought into yeah so like I when I I have no high rank in any martial arts now the highest rank I have is a blue belt in taekwondo. But I have amassed knowledge, and I think about. You've things. been training for a long time in a lot of schools. Training for a long time, yeah. So and the color I, on your waist does not necessarily indicate what you know, as we already talked. I, about. Yeah, exactly. I observe and I think, and sometimes I form an opinion. But then maybe a year, two year later, I think about it again and I revise my opinion. Yeah. So you know, the more you learn. Uh, uh, the more you also learn about yourself, uh, uh, Bruce Lee again. Um, what what's your what's your training look like now? We, we're gonna we're gonna start to wind here, but I wanna I wanna yeah, be yeah, there because I, I know you at the time as well. Uh, I can bit of yeah. I, that's why I tell people like you you have to tell me when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes my job uh, easy. Yeah. Um, my training now. Uh, now I'm back uh, to doing Taekwondo. But luckily, but these past few years when I just didn't deem it very um, wise to be in a room with a lot of people and sure. uh, being covered in other people's bodily fluids, then <laughs> because that is what happens. I mean, normally I wouldn't care, but the uh, situation was different. Uh, so for me, it was like mm, I'm gonna train by myself, and I, I I just trained from 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 memory. But I also had the aid of uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, the channels karate training. Mm -hmm. So Greg and Debbie are the teachers there. That is a very good good YouTube channel. Um, very. Uh, they're very attentive in the videos as well. To okay, if you're training at home, be careful of this. Be careful of that. Um, Adam Chan's channel, a lot of tips from there, uh, and just just you know reading reading about it. Uh, Whistle King, of course, also gives me ideas. Um, so yeah, did did that for a while, um, but the most basic thing is to get in shape because if you're not in shape, you won't be able to fight. That's 
that's the core of everything. So for a long time, because I, I had knee problems, and um, and it started six years ago in an accident, and then um, yeah, couldn't do anything. But I still try to keep in shape. Just go to the gym. Okay, I can't do martial arts, but I can train martial arts a different way. So more studying, actually like studying the martial arts, but not doing it physically, but more mentally. And just keeping my body in shape, just like do some weights, some running as far as my knee knee would allow it. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and when my knee was good enough, just just go back to formal training at a school. And after that, you know, when when pen, pen, when the thing hit, uh, just just training at home, but just doing the same just doing push-ups like because best thing about martial arts is you don't have to use any equipment you can of course if you want to do weapons or whatever you can use your whole body you can do it anywhere you can have a very small room and you can do your wing chun form in there you you can even do a karate form in a small room uh, just have to i was raised it. four four foot by four foot yeah just be be flexible that's also you know, not only flexible in stretching your legs, but also be flexible here. Yeah, and now I'm back to taekwondo training. So um, how does that feel? I, it's, it's a it's a long, you know, at times windy road, and you've kind of come full circle. How does that feel? Yeah, zipping up my boots, going back to my roots. Mm. That's how what it feels like. It's. Uh, yeah, um, it feels good because the school I train at now uh, reminds me of the old school Taekwondo schools that I used to train at. It's W2F, WTF, but um, it's uh, for me, it feels like it feels like the good old days again. Good. Um, and it's also good for my knee because um, I have a full ACL tear it was discovered. Mm. A few weeks ago, uh, talked to the teacher, to the instructor, and he said, okay, we'll find a way around it because I, I want to keep on training. I, I, I don't yeah. want to give up. Yeah. I'm glad. This is where we're going to start to wind down. Okay. And I think you sent over some stuff because you people can learn Mandarin from you, right? I have a YouTube channel. A YouTube channel for that? Yeah, I've only started it recently because I saw so many people teaching on the internet that learn Chinese in three months. And um, of course, that is going to have a lot of people watching your videos, but isn't actually useful. So I, I wanted to make relatively short, useful videos to help people with their Mandarin studies. Mm, nice. Yeah. What's so what's the name of that uh, channel? It's called the uh, Ada Chinese Corner. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, know, I know we've got the doc, so that'll be in the show notes. Okay. I, I yeah, I, I think I I think I sent it to you. So just short videos. I've only just started. So uh um they they're not actually like every time I make one, it's like mm, okay, I can improve there and there. So I yeah, I'm working on it, uh, learning how to edit videos. But I don't want to wait until I learn all of that. I just want to share my knowledge that I have with with people. Um, I, I I love teaching people, and I also love learning myself. And I I know what it is as a foreigner, as a non-native speaker, to to learn Chinese. Um, and through the years, I have become a native speaker of mm -hmm. Chinese. I can say that. Cool. Um, yes. Yeah. Awesome. I've I've actually I've had people talk to me on the phone and then think that I am. Chinese. Of I, I am Taiwanese because I have a bit of a Taiwanese accent, and it's like, oh, no, it's Taiwanese. quite the compliment. It yeah, it, it is. But when people don't believe you and they think you're trying <laughs> to get angry at you, well, I, I'm Dutch, you know, I'm Dutch. Like, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, but you were Taiwanese, but born in Holland. No, I'm I'm just Dutch, you know, nothing there. It's like you're joking, and then uh -huh. then he hung up. He was angry. So, <laughs> I love it. So yeah, you can visit my channel. Uh, yeah, people can visit it. Hope they like it. Uh, leave a comment. And uh, yeah, I also like to uh, you know 
mm, talk to people about martial arts, exchange ideas. Yeah, is there a way people can get a hold of you if they want to if they want to talk martial arts? There's social media or email or something you want to share? Um yeah, I can share that. Um or they can write to me and I can pass it to you if you're more comfortable with that. Uh, not be, if if I say that, I have to spell it out because I have a very unusual, <laughs> unusual first name and last name. So I'm thinking about, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, if if you want it, they can uh, they can find me on Facebook. Okay, that's okay. If they uh, is can they find me through Whistlekick then or? Well, we'll have we'll have links. I mean, once in a while, yeah. we get an inquiry from someone. They're like, "Hey, can you pass this message on to so and so?" Because I don't give out anybody's yeah. contact info. Sure. But if somebody wrote to me, you know, I can pass it to you. I've, I've got ways to okay. get all Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also add my my Facebook link to uh, to the video. Okay, that's okay. All right. And you know what we do now. This is this is where we sign off, but you're signing off. So what words do you want to leave the listeners with today? Leave them with no matter how much trouble you have in your mind, refuse to lose. That is all I can say. And just keep on training. Um, what you can do, just do it. If you don't feel like training, Today, uh, normally maybe you do 20 push-ups, do 10 push-ups today. Okay, don't do 10 kicks, do, do five kicks. But at least, you know, keep on training and keep on learning. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. I want to thank Gad for coming on the show. Wonderful to finally connect, see you face-to-face -face and, and share some stories. I, I had a lot of fun. Audience. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing what you do. Thank you for your support. Remember, you can check out whistlecakemartialartsradio.com for everything related to this episode. And, uh, you know, some of you out there own martial arts schools. Are you looking at your school saying, I would like more? I would like this to be my full time job. I would like to have staff that are better trained. I would like to have more money coming in, more students, whatever it is. We offer consulting. I lead the consulting team. And all the things that we do, the integrity, honesty, functionally driven things we do here at Whistlekick, we extend that into what we do with martial arts schools. We have a 100% success rate with helping schools. So how do you get started? Easiest thing you can do is email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. But if you want to find out a little more before you reach out, if you go to whistlekick.com, under the school section, there is a link for our consulting offering. And we give you a little bit of reason why, some evidence, stuff like that. So check that out. And for any of you, if you're looking to connect with me, if you'd like to have me come to your area for a seminar, your school, or maybe in your general area, because you're, I don't know, a business person, not a school owner. Well, reach out. We can, we can do that. We're constantly setting dates into the future for having me come teach. And depending on how things shake out, maybe you'll see some other Whistlekick folks coming with me. I appreciate all of you. Our social media is at Whistlekick everywhere you might think of. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.